Contemporary art students, this project called the Formidable Five is using five exemplary artworks to introduce really important topics that are going to help you throughout the entire semester. This is our second formidable, formidable artwork, so it's formidable number two, Jackson Pollock's Blue Poles. Denise and I are just going to tell you what we think of it. Here it is. You know what? I don't think we need to be here. <laughs> Denise, I'm going to erase us. Are you ready to okay, disappear? Okay, thank you. Yes, Me too. I'm ready to disappear. <gasps> oh no, we're so big. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so Denise, something okay. that I find when I show this artwork to students is that even though I love it, people look at it and they just can't figure out like an entrance point. Like how am I supposed to look at something like this? So I know you love it too. So what do you, what do, you do when you look at this, oh, something like this? First, I have to get over the um, my five-year-old sister or son could have done this because it you have to think about the context in which it was created but coming from it coming to it from a perspective of um, artistic inspiration or freedom of expression individuality i think there's a way to um, engage with a painting and then come away with some idea either personal or from pollock's perspective of non-representational art and how it can still have content yes so I think that's exactly how I think of it. And one thing that I want to clarify for everybody is that Denise just said non-representational art. That's the key concept that we wanted to introduce for those of you who are working on this formidable five. Non-representational just means it doesn't represent anything. Now that doesn't mean it doesn't have a meaning. It just means that it's not showing you what something looks like. So that word non-representational spelled just how it sounds. That's the kind of big concept for you to work with with this painting. So when something's not representational, like Denise just said, you have to think about context, which means what's going on at the time. After context, what do you do next? I think to, to get into the painting, um, looking at color, looking at lines, looking at scale, looking at space, and then thinking about how you would react. Either, I always ask students, how does it make you feel? Mm -hmm. And so these colors, how do they make you feel? The lines, how do you make you feel? Even if you're walking, if you were to walk on a, uh, in a space that had diagonal lines, would you be running or would you be walking calmly? So it's a yeah. way to understand how to interpret form. When I look at this, I feel like I'm walking through a forest full of spider webs. <laughs> like I can imagine myself like going. So, you know, oh, when no, you I look at those bugs. blue poles, <laughs> then... It's like you're weaving between them with your eyes. And something that is so cool about this painting, I'm going to switch slides really fast. See how huge it is? So when you're standing in front of it, that feeling like you're walking through a forest full of bugs or webs, depending on your perspective, um, there's this sense that it, it fills your whole world. Like your eyes are just overwhelmed because you can't see the borders around it. So you just sort of walk straight into it in your, in your perception. So I'm going to do a quick recap. Um, we've got... When you look at something like this, you want to think about what Denise just said. How does it make you feel? How would it be to be in a space like this? Also, you want to think about context. And then the last thing that I want to ask you, Denise, your opinion on is, um, is the why. Why mm -hmm. would somebody make something that doesn't represent anything? What do you think? I think at this point, you have to look at the time period in which Pollock is working and what's happening within the art world at the time and why he takes this somewhat not new, but for the time period, relatively new, and also for the location, new approach to painting, where you, you have no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. There's no story that's there, at least no story that's, that everyone can then recognize. Mm -hmm. And if you look at historical elements, it tends to make more sense. So because of what was going on at the time, making an image of a smiling person or a tree or a dog didn't fit the kind of cultural mood? Exactly. So this was the new language to fit the mood of that moment. I like that. The new language of art. Right. And then... The 1950s. And part of our students' job is to figure out why does that context create this feeling that we have to obliterate images. Yeah. Purge them of everything recognizable. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, when I think about it, there's got to be some really strong things going on to make me want to have all of this empty space without, like clear references to the real world to kind of explore in so and you, yeah I think also because this is such an individual approach to painting 
you look at what's going on with the artist in addition to what's going on around the artist and then mm -hmm. that will help you yeah. understand that context. Good. So we are about at the end of our video. I'm going to do a really fast recap of what we want you to kind of use as your seed for your project here. You don't need to be thinking just about this one painting, but more, why would an artist make non-representational art? What does that mean for art? What could it mean for you? What kind of things in your life might make you think, I need to have an abstract space like this? So that's kind of your point of departure. Any last word? I love Paul. Yeah, <laughs> I love him too. I love him too. Okay, thank you. We'll see you all in our next video.